fait, sur le moment, ça va coûter cher. Au final, ça va pas. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming again. Today, we are going to have uh, two talks, uh, one uh, given by Evi and another one by Moritz. And uh, later, we're going to have a discussion. And uh, if during the talks you have any questions, you can ask them just during the talks, I guess. Or if you want uh, to have a discussion and listen both opinions, you can just keep them and ask during the discussion. We are going to have some questions from ourselves, but you can also join. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can start with the first talk. And again, uh, the speaker is uh, Ilya Pisedin, and uh, Ilya is a postdoc in uh, Quantum Devices Lab at ETH Zurich and also at PSI. And uh, he's working on uh, quantum computing systems with superconducting qubits. And his talk is going to be about the system, so the floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction. Very nice to be here. Interested people. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. So uh, I'll be talking about quantum computing, and uh, first we'll discuss what a quantum computer is actually supposed to do, what's the idea, and then uh, I'll be talking about uh, how you build them from superconductors, and then we'll discuss what the problem is, the problem is decoherence, and uh, what, to be, what is going to be done about that, in yeah, how do you solve that. So, First things first, quantum computer is like a regular computer, but quantum. So what does a regular computer do? Uh, and that's easy. So you perform, essentially it performs calculations. So you write some program in your favorite language, and then it gets translated into the native instruction set of your PC. And so essentially those are elementary operations that the uh, CPU, the computer, actually knows how to do. And then, okay, you have a compiler that does that for you. And uh, then, okay, these are just letters, but they mean instructions, so they can be directly encoded into instructions for the, for the CPU. And the CPU is uh, essentially built out of one, maybe two, several uh, elementary basic building blocks, and one of those building blocks could be a logical NAND gate, okay, it's a symbol, essentially it's a thing that has two wires as inputs, and one thing, or one wire as an output, and that's a NOT AND, so it does an AND on the inputs, and then it does a NOT on the result, and that's the output. Yeah, easy thing, and then if you have billions of them and you connect the wires correctly, then you get a modern processor. And, yeah. Um, now, when people first started thinking about quantum computing, uh, it was physicists in the beginning of the 80s, probably late 70s, and they were thinking about um, quantum simulation. Now, uh, classical simulation is when you have uh, some physical system and you know the laws governing it, like Newton's uh, laws, like this, right? And uh, you want to see what will happen with it after some time. You know the initial state, you want to see what happens after some time. And the way you do it, you just integrate those equations um, like numerically. And uh, this requires some amount of computational power. So you need uh, each, uh, say, body, each ball has a, a position and a velocity, and space is three dimensional. So you have uh, roughly six numbers that you need to store per, per object, so six and uh, three n degrees of freedom, six n numbers, and that's how you do a typical simulation. Now, if you're doing quantum mechanics, I don't know how many of you have done quantum mechanics, but let's suppose all of you, uh, then you probably know that it is Schrodinger's equation that uh, governs the mechanics. And uh, the problem with the Schrodinger equation is that it describes the evolution of the wave function, and the wave function is a probability amplitude density. So each combination of positions of the balls, or the electrons, because balls don't really need this, electrons, for example, do, uh, each combination would require uh, a probability amplitude assigned to it. So that means that the amount of numbers you need to store is not just the state it is, but rather for each state, what is the probability of that? And the amount of states is exponentially large with the amount of degrees of freedom. So that's the problem why 
you need quantum computers. That's what they thought about. And if you're okay, if you have just two possible states, because okay, electrons have spin, spin up, spin down, for example, uh, so two possible states, and then you have 60, uh, 60 electrons uh, just storing those probability amplitudes would require some enormous amount of memory, and you probably don't have that amount. And even if you do, then you can say, okay, what about 70 bits? And that immediately becomes impossible. So that's what the idea about quantum computing was. Now, just that we have some continuity. So, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if there's a very urgent question, we can ask now. If there's uh, oh. not terribly urgent, then because I'm trying to watch the time. So there's a thing called analog electronics back in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 40s, was uh, like you wanted to do a simulation and then you build analog electronics, analog computing, so you construct a system that behaves according to the same laws as your, uh, the system that you're trying to simulate does. For example, if you have uh, like gravity, and you can construct a, a circuit with three operation amplifiers, and it will be governed by the same differential equation, and then you can see how a ball falling down would behave if you look at the voltage at the right nodes. And, uh, which is good, you just need three elements, and you can solve a differential equation, that's good. But uh, then if you have noise anywhere, uh, then, uh, yeah, if you have pickup, a radio, anything, then that becomes your signal as well, and that screws everything up. So instead of that, we use digital computers. We, yeah, we take the position, we digitize it. So instead of having one degree of freedom, we're turning it into multiple degrees of freedom. And in each degree of freedom, we have either a zero and a one. And since we have thresholding ability, so we can say, okay, 0.5 volts, everything below that is zero, everything above that is one, we can actually uh, use an error-free mode, so the noise is actually not destroying, not making error-free computation impossible completely. Uh, yeah. So now quantum computing, finally we're there. Um, quantum computing, the thing that I'm going to talk about, like quantum computing is super overhyped. There's like a lot of people who are saying, well, I'm going to do quantum <coughs> computing, and they can mean different things. Like them. some of them are building something people understand what it is, some of them are doing something completely different. I'm going to talk about gate-based quantum computing. And gate-based quantum computing is a, kind of an extension of classical digital computer. So you have bits, again, and then you want to do operations on them, like the NAND thing is like the two-qubit gate. Now, the difference here is that in classical computing, you have kind of two input wires, one output wire, and they the signals coexist in time. In quantum computing, we do it differently. We have like two physical uh, bodies containing a state, and then we do so something, we operate on them, and then they change their state. So kind of the computation exists in time. Like these wires, these are not actual signals that coexist with these ones. At first this, then you do something about them, and you get these two states. They're not existing at the same time. It's just important a thing about quantum computing that's important to understand. So the gate is an operation. It's not a physical thing. Uh, okay. And then uh, we also have single qubit gates and readout. And unlike classical bits, reading out uh, spoils everything. If you know Schrodinger's cat, he's either dead or alive. Once you see, it doesn't work anymore. So quantum algorithms, you can't read out in the middle. Readout needs to be explicit. Now, um, with qubits, uh, yeah, if you take a single bit, a single bit has two states, like 0 and 1, and the circuit for a single bit might look like this, so that's a DRAM cell, and uh, there's only two things you can do. You can either reset it, or you can flip it. If it's a 0, it becomes a 1. If it was a 1, it becomes a 0. And uh, with a quantum bit, you actually have two probability amplitudes, like for the 0 state, for the 1 state, and... Uh, like these probability amplitudes are complex numbers. You have a phase difference between the two complex numbers. That's uh, the phase difference is phi, uh, if you wish to encode it with this Bosphere thing. And uh, theta, like the probability is proportional to the projection on the z-axis. So theta is kind of the probability, the absolute value thing. 
I don't want to explain this in a lot of time because I don't have a lot of time. And if you measure, if you measure, then you get either zero or one, and uh, the probability with which you get it is again uh, the projection on the z-axis. And operations are rotations of that. Like you, you have a vector here, right? Any rotation uh, uh, through uh, around an axis going through the center of the sphere is a single cubic gate. So you got infinite amount of gates available, not just two. Okay, um, classical bits, they operate, uh, there's a capacitance, you have a voltage, roughly one volt, that's usually what we have. Uh, a bit is encoded with 10,000 electrons, roughly. And you have a nonlinear element because it's difficult to build a computer just from resistances, inductances, and capacitances. You know, linear circuits, like the signals don't interact. It's impossible to build a computer out of that, so you need a nonlinear element. It's a field effect transistor. And for our superconducting qubits, we use the Josephson junction because it's dissipationless. And now uh, the capacitance are roughly the same, but the voltages that we use are several orders of magnitude less. And you see that the actual quantum begins with the amount of electrons that encode one qubit. So it's very low. Okay, so why is the electric circuit at all quantum? So the way we uh, come to this is, okay, you have the usual description of electric circuit, Kirchhoff's laws, like the relation between current and voltage for different elements. But then you can also do a Lagrangian description, like I don't know, analytical mechanics things. Uh, yeah, Anna said that we, it's bachelor students level, so everyone knows analytical mechanics. Is that true? Everyone knows it. Okay, that's great. Uh, so the generalized coordinate is going to be the antiderivative of voltage. So you've got voltage here, you're doing the antiderivative, and this happens to have the dimension of magnetic flux. Like in Faraday's law, you say, okay, derivative of flux is voltage, you induced voltage from current, changing current, and here it's the opposite, just written differently. And then you can write down uh, kinetic energy as a function of uh, uh, squared uh, derivative of this generalized coordinate uh, and uh, the potential energy is just flux over twice the inductance and then you also get one for this system an equation of motion which is exactly the same and of course once you have that you can quantize it like harmonic oscillator I don't know how many of you had quantum mechanics but it's a harmonic oscillator just now what is important that the wave function is not a function of position but it's a function of flux, where flux is defined as an antiderivative of voltage. Okay, now why superconductivity? We have a nice nonlinear element, the Josephson junction. Now, if you have a wire, you can see the current phase relation or current flux relation of a wire is this. So when you have a current flowing through a wire, there's magnetic fields, you get a magnetic flux. I'm not going to discuss where exactly, like through which surface. Don't worry, it's just some magnetic flux. And uh, you see that the relation is linear. Now here, for the Josephson junction, there's so-called Josephson relation, and then the relation is nonlinear. And this parameter, which decides how nonlinear, uh, can be very small. Like five nanoamperes, that sounds quite small, right? And you have uh, two like superconductors, and these are small superconductors. And the way it works is that uh, down here you have two layers, like the bottom layer, the top layer, and in between you have a layer of insulator, and this is a tunnel junction. If you cool it down and it becomes, and everything is superconducting, it becomes a dissipationless uh, element. Yeah, so you don't have that with optics. No such strong nonlinear elements in optics. And the thing we do with it, we uh, build a nonlinear LC circuit. Now the the, the capacitance comes, okay, you know, you're looking from top on the chip which has a transform qubit, so it's a LC circuit, the capacitance comes from electric fields from this island thing to ground, so there's electric fields between them, if you put a voltage here, there will be some mutual capacitance. It's not, it doesn't have to be a lot, it's just 100 femtofarads, that's, that's not a lot, believe me. And then you have the, the junction, and this gives you like this kind of Hamiltonian. Now, instead of this linear inductance, you have a nonlinear inductance and you have energy levels. And then you see that instead of harmonic oscillator, where the energy levels are 
equidistant. Uh, these are like the spacings are different, and you can address just one transition. This is the transition we will be working at with the brown state and the first excited state. Okay. So there's a lot going on here. So this is a quantum processor from the lab I'm working at right now. And this has 17 qubits, like you can count them if you want to. And okay, this is the qubit and the rest are things to do the gates. And uh, so there's a wire to do single qubit operations, the purple one. There's the wire to do readout, the red one. And there's blue wires to do, uh, that connect the qubit to neighboring qubits to do two qubit gates. Okay, and then there's a Hamiltonian, but I don't want to get into it too much. Okay, the, all the terms are marked with the respective colors, like this is the actual qubit part, like the, like the fact that it has an energy difference between the ground state and the first excited state, and then the rest are just coupling to different signals. Okay, so single qubit gates, uh, what you do is you just have this line and you apply voltage in resonance, like a AC voltage in resonance with a qubit uh, frequency, and then what you get is essentially, depending on the phase of that AC signal, you'll get rotations around axis in this equatorial plane with different axis. So, and the stronger your pulse is, the more rotation you get. So that's easy. Single qubit gates, everyone knows how to do them, and not only in superconducting qubits. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that easy. Now the two qubit gates and superconducting qubits are a bit more complicated, so Everyone does them differently, like Google, IBM, I don't know. This is an IBM style gate because it's easy to explain. So the way it works is you have two qubits, right? And then what you want to do is a C0 gate. A C0 flips the target qubit if the control qubit is excited. And the way it does it here is you apply a drive to the first qubit on the frequency of the second qubit. The first qubit works like a state-dependent filter. So uh, the reason why it does that is you, when you drive this qubit, there's this transition which uh, you induce kind of uh, AC charge on this qubit, which is um, the amount that you uh, induce depends on the detuning from the transition. But then there's the second transition, which is only excited if you're in the uh, excited state. Yeah. Uh, Probably that's not so important. The important thing is just a state-dependent filter, and then uh, the amount of drive you have on this qubit depends on the state of the first one. If you apply a compensation pulse on this one, which cancels out the signal that goes from the first qubit when the first qubit in the, is in the ground state, then you only get a rotation if the first qubit is in the excited state, and after compensation you get this gate, and the Hamiltonian has this state-dependent part, which has a sigma z, sigma x, type interaction. I don't know how good that is, but yeah, fairly easy. Now, readout. Readout, we need to do it explicitly, of course. So the way we do it, we just have a, we have an auxiliary like a resonator, an extra degree of freedom. And uh, we have a, like a microwave line going here. We send in microwaves on the resonance frequency of this red thing. Okay, and the, these microwaves, they get scattered by this resonance. The scattering coefficient depends slightly on the qubit state. And then uh, if you do, like, uh, if you down-convert, so these resonators are 6 gigahertz, if you down-convert and look at the envelope of the, these microwaves after they are going out, you'll see that these envelopes are different for different states. So this is ground state, this is the first excited state, and actually you've seen that there's more states than the first excited state. They're all different. And this is how you tell. But this is averaged over many, many shots. And just one, one of the shots would look like mostly noise. So it's a not very accurate readout. Moritz's readout will be, look much better than that. OK. Uh, so what's the problem about qubits, specifically superconducting qubits? It's decoherence. A decoherence is complicated, so I'll only be talking about loss because that's the most important thing about qubit, the superconducting qubits. So you've got this, I don't know, circular shape transmit, right? And then you've got electric fields, because that's the capacitance, right? So you've got electric fields from this superconducting island, you've got the substrate below, usually it's silicon, and then the electric fields go to this ground electrode, 
And uh, yeah, which means that you polarize the silicon because it's a dielectric, right? It has its uh, dielectric permittivity, something around 11. If you apply an electric field, like the electron orbitals, they start to change shape. And uh, if it's an AC field, they start moving, right? Just start oscillating. And like the dielectric constant has, you can say it has two components, the real part, the imaginary part, and the imaginary part is responsible for losses. And that's because like this motion, it's lossy, it couples to phonons. And phonons is heat and dissipation. And uh, all dielectrics, if you do some electromagnetic simulations, uh, they usually characterized by a dielectric loss tangent. And for different materials, it's different. Like the, the silicon is actually pretty good. Vacuum is perfect. Like dielectric loss tangent is just zero. But like the silicon is pretty good. But the interfaces between the silicon, so if you look at and to zoom in here, right, uh, where you have this electrode, this thin film, it's not actually super thin. There's a lot of atoms there. And then there's also on the interface, there's oxides. There's a lot of stuff, hydrogen, and all that stuff. Uh, also couples to electric fields. And it's super lossy, and that is actually the main source of decoherence for these type of qubits. And then uh, you can see that typical qubits are 6 gigahertz, and this is a, a measurement of how, much, how fast the energy decays. So if you excite the qubit, wait for some time, how it decays, this one has an exponential decay constant of 50 microseconds. Okay, what do we do about errors? I mean, essentially what I told you is if you kind of, you have a memory, a bit, you store one in it, and then it loses it after 50 microseconds. You can't build a computer out of that, right? Actually, if you think about the DRAM, the DRAM does exactly that. It does lose its information, it does a refresh cycle. So I, I don't remember how often, but like one millisecond or something, it uh, checks all the bits, reads them out, and then stores it back so that it doesn't discharge. And then it's error-free, and there's ECC memory, which is more expensive, and then you don't have any errors at all. But yeah, how does error correction work in classics? If you, after all, do have an error, you just encode one logical bit in several uh, physical bits. And if one of them has an error, then you can still extract, uh, like with a majority vote, find which state it was, because like, uh, uh, yeah, you need to flip more than one to kind of uh, get a different state. And this code is called a distance three code because the code words are one, 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 and zero, zero, zero. And if you flip just one, you can say, okay, that is probably just one has flipped, and then you can tell which state it was. And then uh, the probability of losing information if you have a 50 microseconds lifetime, uh, if you just encode in one qubit, it goes exponentially, but then with three qubits, uh, you need at least two to flip, and the probability of two to flip over time is a kind of, it doesn't follow an exponent, but it has this quadratic dependence close to the beginning. And then if you do this checking every, let's say, two microseconds, like, and you see, okay, how many have flipped? Okay, let's return them back to the encoded state. And you do that over and over again, every two microseconds, then your decay time will be the, the green curve. So that's, uh, yeah, that's how error correction works. And yeah, you can't do the DRAM thing with bits, with qubits, of course, because uh, you have position states, you can't do that. I mean, if you read out, you're done. So instead of that, you're reading out parities. You have this nice circuit, which essentially you, in, you've got three data qubits, right, the same bits, and you've got two, we call them auxiliary or ancillary qubits, and then in these qubits you perform a circuit, okay, these, these C not gates, you flip this thing once if this one is excited, then once if this one is excited, and you do the same with Z1 and D1 and D2, and then you measure it. So you're not actually measuring the state. If you're doing this circuit, you don't know which logical state it is, but you can tell which qubit has flipped. So it's kind of seeing if what error has occurred without actually measuring the logical state. Yeah, this works. Now, apparently with, super con with qubits, you also have face flip errors because as we just uh, decided, like the 
phase of state is a point on this sphere, and a bit flip error, like the usual error, is when zero becomes one. But if you are somewhere on the, on the equator, for example, and then it flips, uh, like just the face is flipped, you won't see it on those syndromes, like on those checks, but you can do an X type check. So it's just the same, but if you do a rotation, uh, which, uh, like a rotation around uh, some axis between Z and Y, you just, yeah, the, the sphere is round, so it's more or less symmetric. It's essential that you have two types of errors which you need to correct. And apparently, it doesn't matter what kind of error you have, you can always decompose into those two. And uh, if you are able to uh, solve bit flip errors and face flip errors, that's enough. And now, okay, the, finally I've come to what my lab is doing. So this is the sur surface 17 thing. Um, it has 17 qubits, and it is an error correction code. So you see that there's a Z type parity checks, X type parity checks, and this is kind of uh, one logical bit. So this is this huge circuit that checks for X type errors and Z type errors. So these are Z type errors, this is the X type error checking part. It's big, and the problem with that is like if you produce more errors during this circuit, then you're actually correcting. That doesn't really help. So you need to, there's a threshold after which error correction works. And this code is good in that sense that the error correction threshold is relatively low. And then there's uh, logical lifetimes. There's the blue, the blue and the green things like this is for x uh, eigenstates, this is for z eigenstates. And you can see that logical lifetimes are actually worse than the, the black curves, which you can't really see here, but the, the black ones are a bit, uh, they decay slower. So this is not a very good implementation of an error correction code in the sense that the quantum memory that you've created decays faster than the, uh, than the qubits composing it. But uh, yeah, it's still quite difficult to do and there's a lot of interesting things there. So we've kind of demonstrated a bad state preservation experiment. It also included fault tolerance state preparation readout. And then there's still a lot to do like fault tolerant gates and preparation of uh, states that you can't uh, like. So these error correction codes, they, uh, I don't think this is very interesting. I look at the audience, everyone is already dead. So uh, I'll better talk about the fact that this code is kind of a bit rudimentary. It's like you have nine qubits, you have eight auxiliary qubits, 17 qubits just to encode one, and it's not even good. So there's a lot of theory work also uh, involved in developing better codes that would actually be implementable in hardware with a relatively low overhead. And that's it. So I hope you now know what this Kipuksu quantum computer is supposed to do, a bit about superconducting quantum electric circuits and loss and quantum error correction, and I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much, I guess uh, we can leave questions for the end uh, of the section. Yes, so the second talk uh, of uh, today meetings is uh, given by Moritz, and uh, Moritz is uh, the PhD student in uh, TQ Lab, it's a trapped ions, and uh, it's another way to do quantum computing, and uh, we are going to listen to this presentation now, so the floor is yours. Let me just get rid of the Zoom thing. Now, you can also hide the. Um, yeah, do you see where? Hide floating meeting controls. Wow. Now we're good. Okay, hello, I'm Moritz. Um, I work in the Trapped Iron Quantum Information Group at ETH Zurich. And so, what we do is we trap ions to try to build uh, similar types of devices that Ilya told you about. And today, I think my goal is to give you an operational understanding of how we operate those computers. Yeah. So the idea is that you don't necessarily understand all the details, but you, that you have an idea of what we do. Maybe you find it interesting. You want to learn more about it. Um, but first, we need to ask ourselves, what do we actually need? Yeah. And there's a certain 
David Di Vincenzo, in 2000, he was pretty smart and sat down and said, okay, there's five things we need, yeah? And the first thing is that we need scalable, which physical system with good qubits. So the qubit is what Ilya has shown you, it's this entity of information that I can, entity of physical thing that I can encode information in, and I need many of them, you know, because I want to perform calculations that I can't do on a piece of paper. And they need to be good. Yeah? And then I also need to prepare them in a state where I know where they are so that I that they're not somewhere, but they're actually in a state. And we call this a fiducial state. Yeah? I need this state, or the two states they can live in, to live for long times. So this is what Ilya said us trying to do with quantum error correction. Yeah? But so the, the information needs to live for long inside the qubit. And we need to manipulate this information. So we need something we call a universal quantum gate set. In classical computers, usually you have AND, or NAND gates, which are, for example, a NAND gate we'll call universal. Um, for quantum computers, it's a bit more complicated, but you need single qubit gates and you need two qubit gates. So you need to operate things on a single qubit and make two qubits talk to each other. And finally, I did all of these nice things with my computer. I also need to get the information out. So I need to be able to measure. Yeah. And we call this a measurement apparatus. Yeah? And it turns out ions are, are not bad at all of this, and I will tell you why now. But first, we need to get some ions. And the way we do this is, so ions are positively charged particles. And for example, let's take calcium plus. And yeah, that's what I do in the lab. And, and we build these uh, ion traps. So an ion trap is roughly like this size, like my thumb, picture my thumb. This is as big as my thumb. And um, it's a piece of glass. Here I show you a cross section. Yeah, so it's actually it actually looks like this. Yeah. So this is our wasted pointer. Oh, just uh, behind you. Right. So this thing sits on here, and this is roughly 20 centimeters tall. And inside this trap, so this is a piece of glass that I machined, and then we, we have some electrodes on it, we can trap actually calcium ions using oscillating electromagnetic fields. So here you see a little string, and actually these, each of those is an individual piece of calcium. Yeah. And then I put this whole thing into a vacuum chamber, because I don't want those guys to be disturbed. Otherwise, I would be trapping dust or other things. And I put a big objective next to it so that I can look at them. And then I have some other glass. So we call this a viewport. So it's a piece of glass that protects the vacuum for the outside, but I can still look into it. Yeah. So then I can shoot lasers at it. And most of the operations we do are, are done using lasers. So this is uh, the setup I built, for example. Yeah. And then. But now, how do you use an ion to encode information? So an ion is basically a core with an electron flying around. And maybe you remember from chemistry, there are several orbitals you can use uh, you, that exist. And the electron can be in those orbitals. So I, I draw these a circle. For example, this would be an s orbital. And I would say this is a 0. And if the electron happens to be in the other orbital, I will say it's a 1. In practice, they look a bit more complicated, and actually there's a bunch of those orbitals. So this would be an S, this is a P, this is a D. And they have different properties that we can then also use. And I'll, I'll show you in a second why they're useful. OK, so let's agree on a qubit. Um, let's say the S orbital is my 0, and a D orbital is a 1. And why did I choose the D orbital? Well, there's a few reasons, but one of them is that it lives for very long. If I put my electron in there, it will stay there for, on average, 1.17 seconds, which is a bit better than the 50 microseconds that Ilya has shown. But there's other problems with that, yeah. And the, the way we do single qubit gates is by, so this is a good qubit, we're happy. And the way I do a single qubit gate is I take my little iron and I shine a laser at it, and then I can actually drive this transition coherently and perform uh, Rabi oscillations, or what he has shown as single qubit rotations. So in this blosphere picture, I will have my qubit rotate. Okay, so the single qubits are done by shining a laser. And the next thing, oh, this is like, no, okay. The next thing is that I want to be know in which state the ion is. And I can do this by using another orbital, which is a p orbital, which doesn't live for very long. It lives for seven nanoseconds. 
So if I throw my ion up there, again using a laser, it will immediately come back down and emit a photon, which is blue. Um, and these blue photons can be collected, and you can look at it on a camera. Actually, you'll shoot a laser, it will emit many photons, one every seven nanoseconds at most, and, and then you, you see this on a camera. And conversely, if now my electron was actually in the one state, it's up here, but I drive this transition, I cannot move around my electron, and nothing happens, and my ion is dark. So in the lab, this will look like this. If it's bright, I see something. If it's dark, I know it's a, so if it's bright, I know it's a zero. If it's dark, I know it's a one. And then I just have an apparatus that counts photons. So if I got 18 photons, I know I'm in a one. But actually, because I'm shining a laser, there might be some photons still getting into the measurement device, but OK. And then I say, if I got less than six photons, I know it was a zero. I know it was a one, sorry. It should be a one. So these are bright events, and these are dark events. And so I can read out. Cool. I have a qubit, and I can read it out. And I can measure. Now, I still need to reset my qubit. And the way we do this reset is by using yet another orbital and another laser. You get the two. So lasers solve all, all our problems. So the end goal of the reset is that we end up in this state here. We want the electron to sit at the bottom. And so if it's at the bottom, we win. If it was up here, however, we just shoot a laser into this short-lived state, and then the electron is like, oh, oh no, I don't want to stay here. I come down, and it scatters a photon, actually red this time. Uh, no, it's not red. It's also blue. It's also blue. And um, this will actually reduce the entropy of the system. In fact, in reality, you need a few more, because there's a few more orbitals. But uh, I need three more lasers, actually, to do this. But the principle is this. So I can initialize. OK, but I have not told you one thing. And that's that um, ions are usually hot. So I trap them. But in reality, they usually move around a lot. And by that, I mean that they are hot. And actually, I want them to slow down such that I can manipulate them a bit better. And now I'll show you how to do laser cooling. Who here has heard of laser cooling? Oh, a few people. Cool. Nice. OK, so I'm going to try to explain with hands how laser cooling works. So this is um, the number of photons scattered as a function of the laser frequency. So if I make my laser more blue, it's along this axis. And if it's more red, it's along this axis. And we all, who, who doesn't know the Doppler effect? Maybe I think everybody knows what the Doppler effect is. Um, it's the ambulance that comes by, change the frequency. Now, imagine you're the iron, and you're actually moving around in the trap. And let's assume for a second you're hot, and you're moving away. Actually, what happens, and, and I decide to shoot my laser not at the resonance, but a bit red of the resonance. Yeah? bit left of it. When it's moving away, it sees an even lower frequency and will scatter less photons. So you only scatter one photon. However, if I'm now moving towards the laser, the ion sees a higher frequency. Yeah. And what happens is that it scatters a lot of photons. Why does this cool? So more photons are scattered when moving towards the laser. Let's summarize. Imagine you're the ion, but you're actually on a swing. And you have a, well, actually, your knee is on your swing, and you have a really big water gun. But you only shoot at her while she comes to you. At you yeah? Then, actually, you will slow her down. You can think about this. If you're on a swing, and you only get water thrown at you while you go towards the water being thrown down, it will dissipate your energy. Yeah? And this will slow you down. Yeah? So in a sense, this is how you laser cool. You engineer some dissipation that depends on the speed at which you go, and then you can cool. This doesn't get you to the ground state, though. Yeah? It gets you in a regime where you're already very cold, but you're not at the quantum mechanical ground state yet. Um, who knows what the quantum harmonic oscillator is here? OK, half the repeat. OK. So a harmonic oscillator is just a pendulum. But what happens in quantum mechanics is that the states get discretized. When you're very cold, 
you have a quantum mechanical effects which come into play. And what I mean by that is that you can't be, if I, if I draw energy on this axis and the occupation, you, you can't be anything in between these places. So there's something called a Fox state, and you have either zero energy or one quanta of energy or two quanta of energy, etc. It's the same concept as for photons. And usually with Doppler cooling, you get to a, a few Fox <coughs> states. So this is the, the motion. You have to think the energy levels are discrete. Usually you'll get to like five or three or two. And our goal is to end up here, at the very bottom of the energy ladder, to be at absolute zero Kelvin. Yeah. No more energy in there. And there's a technique, which I find quite elegant, which I'll tell you a bit about, which is called resolved sideband cooling, which allows you to do this. And the idea is the following. You have your orbitals, and actually now you have a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces, of, with the orbitals and the motion. What I mean with, by this technical word is that I plotted here the energy levels that the system can occupy, and this here is motion. This, so this means very excited in the motion, and this is very little excited in the motion. Yeah. So in this picture, we are here. So this is the one, two, three, four state. So this would be one, two, three, four. And on this axis here, this is the one state, and this is the zero state. So these are my orbitals. So what I mean when I say I'm here, this means I'm in the fourth energy state of the motion and in the ground state of the orbital. And I can drive transitions between these states. So I can move my electron around, but now I removed one quanta of the motion. So notice what happened. Look up here as well. But I also excited the spin, the electron. And we, you remember that we know how to reset as well. So this we know. So I can reset my electron, and I can walk down the ladder this way. And I do this around 20 times in my experiment, and I'm in the absolute ground state. Like, there's no more energy. It's not exactly exact, because there's always zero-point fluctuation. I'm at the ground state of motion. So this is how we can laser cool. You first do Doppler cooling, and then sideband cool. So OK, we have done good qubits. We have done state preparation, single qubit gates, readout, and ground state cooling. How much time do I have left? Around uh, 10, 15 minutes. 10 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Then I'll, okay, then I'll attempt something. And this is to explain you how we do a two qubit gate. It's not entirely trivial, but bear with me. You're going to have to accept some things. But first, okay, so I showed you how we do it with one eye, but we want to build a processor out of it. And we usually trap them in a string. So this is an iron string. This is also a picture from my setup. Um, and oh, for example, another setup at ETH can do very long strings. So all of these are individual lines. And here, it's not that they move, but it's that the camera has aberrations. Yeah? And you can picture each of those ions as encoding one bit of information, one qubit. OK, and now they have another property. They are all positively charged. So if you put them together in a potential, well, which is what we do when we trap them, um, they all move together. And I'll explain this in a second. But the goal here is to do uh, this two qubit gate. Who is familiar with this notation? Few people. OK. So what I mean here, this is the input state. This is the input state, and this is the output state. What I mean is if I put 0, 0 in, I get 0, 0 out. If I get 0, 1 in, I get 0, 1 out, etc. Until I get 1, 1 in, I get minus 1 times 1, 1 out. This is something called a controlled phase gate. This phase here is a quantum mechanical phase. Um, and it's a, it's a very quantum property. But you can also think about it, you can do other gates, which are called controlled knots, which is if one qubit is in a one state, then it flips another qubit. And if it's in a zero state, it doesn't flip. But OK, let's, let's take two of such qubits, for example, this one and this one. And let, I'll show you how we can engineer an interaction that does this, these two qubit gates. And this is a realization of a cirac zoller gate. Um, in practice, we don't really do Exactly this, but it's similar. The idea is the same. 
Okay, so the thing we're going to use is that I move collectively. They're all positively charged. They don't like each other. They move together. And usually they are ground state cooled. And we're going to use the fact that we were able to ground state cool from previously to do some interactions. So I'm going to take iron A and shoot a laser at it that drives this red sideband that we saw before. But now instead of, of doing it for cooling, we do it to do a gate. If the electron is here, there's nothing to drive. So nothing happens. If the electron is up here, then the whole chain what happened? gets excited. And now I'm showing you here another ion, which maybe was in the ground state. And that gets, um, sorry, this, this is another ion. Yeah. This is this guy. And he now also got excited on the movement, but not the spin didn't change. Yeah. So now I'm going to drive a laser on the second ion and have it do a little loop in phase space. And this little loop, so I, I took another level and had it made a loop. And this actually make that it makes it that it acquires a phase. Yeah? And notice that this only happens if this electron is, if this, the, the string is excited. Because if it's not excited, there's nothing to drive here. Yeah? So the electron must be here, not here. And then we go back. And then we recover the initial state plus the phase that we have acquired from before. So, okay, we realize this. And then there's, in the literature you can look up, and then the, the typical thing people quote is the fidelity. Per perform an operation, how well did it work? And uh, these are the, in ions we have the, the best two qubit gates in the field with the, 99.94% fidelity is in 35 microseconds. And it's always important to compare the fidelity, but also the time it takes you to perform the gate with respect to the coherence time of your qubits. Because if you have a very good gate, but it takes forever, then it doesn't help you. And there's also other types of gates that we can do, for example, without lasers. Yeah. Okay. And, but now I've shown you how to work with like two or three or four ions, but we actually need a lot. And for this, there's uh, people in the 2000s who have come up with the QCCD architecture. Ignore the, the, no, the, the words, but it basically means that you build like a processor where there's ions in many locations, and you can shuffle them around and do operations on them. This was a theoretical paper in 2002, and now actually 20 years later, people have built all the building blocks. So this is actually a, an ion chart quantum processor from Honeywell. We're building these beautiful racetrack processors, um, which has come out this year, and they have excellent fidelities. Yeah. And what you also see is that we have these junctions, and this same uh, company also has demonstrated that we can do junctions. And they, they really work. So. so I wanted to point out that people have thought about scaling. And now I want to talk something that we do at ETH and that we pioneered, and that is that we, we want to send out light directly from the chip. So, so far, I don't know if you remember from my drawing, I have a big vacuum chamber and I'm like aligning my laser on my ions by hand. But um, there's other ways of doing that and that is sending the light in through an optical fiber through here. And then this is an ion trap. The ions sit above there, here, and then it comes out of the, out of the chip. And, and the way we do this is by having, this is a structure, it's called the gradient structure. So what happens is the light comes in here, and then it hits this grating. So this is this grating. This is this, which is here, and the ions sit on top. Yeah. And you have to imagine it's basically just a lens that's very close to the ions and allows us to shoot lasers at it in a useful way and where we don't have to align mirrors. Yeah. Yes, so this is recent progress as well um, from our group. And I want to highlight some things that have happened. I think this is a bit encyclopedic now uh, for those who are a bit deeper in the field. And these are recent um, quantum error correction experiments that have been done in ions. Um, so people have done a color code. So this is similar to either surface code. And pe people have done transversal gates, which is something you need to do, um, which basically means that if one error happens, it doesn't get propagated 
somewhere else. And people have built complete circuits out of this, where you do a fault tolerant uh, one bit addition. So it's very primitive things. So. But, um, but in, in, with using error correction, so the circuits look like this. Um, and what is missing is that this actually helps with coherence times. So at ETH, we've also started thinking in, in terms of other routes. And, and one of those is to think, hey, but um, so why do you even encode information in the orbitals? Because you use the, the motion to do the gates. Why not use also the motion to encode the information? And there we have um, shown that you can encode information into the quantum harmonic oscillator. Uh, so maybe you took analytical mechanics. Who took analytical mechanics here? Yeah, a few. So maybe you remember that you draw um, the phase phase space. Um, and this is actually a quantum mechanical phase space. And you see that this is actually position and momentum. And what you should read here is that the ion sits here and here and here at the same time. And then you can think that if it wiggles around a little bit, you can still recover uh, the initial information because the one, so this is a zero, and the one would be where it sits here and here and here and here. So it, it has this distance, physical distance, the zero and the one where the separate is from. Uh, and we have shown that you can do also quantum error correction with this. So this is the unprotected state and then we correct this state. And using very similar states, actually superconducting cavities have done something called a break even where they actually improve any logical information time. Um, so this is something we call a continuous variable quantum error correction or bosonic quantum error correction and, and that we're actively working on. And yes, so actually I should say, do you have any questions? No? Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you a bit what we do at TIKI. Um, so TIKI stands for trapped ion quantum information, it's our group. Uh, we do these on-chip photonics and this bosonic quantum error correction, which I've told you about. Um, we also invented new types of traps, um, for example, to trap in 2D. So, so far we only needed, always had to use those strings, but uh, there's microfabricated panning traps, and then you can do 2D arrays where the ions sit in a 2D structure, which looks a bit more like what Ilya has shown you. Uh, we also work on cat states. I think somebody I saw has a cat on his computer. Um, so this is a, a four-legged cat. Yeah. At least we call those like this. It's also a, a subclass of bosonic quantum error correction. And we work on Rydberg states. We also look for a fifth force. And we do spectroscopy on molecules. And we also have a theory subgroup. And bear with me one more time. Uh, we also have a, a, a subgroup at PSE, where also Ilya is neighbor of, uh, where we have a 50 ion setup, and we design new control electronics and have a cryogenic setup and an engineering unit, which is called Tiki Tech. This website doesn't work. <laughs> so I did a joke. Yes, okay, this is Tiki and PSI, and if you're interested in what we do, you can also try to apply for semester and master projects, where we're usually happy to have people who come from everywhere. And yeah. So I guess now it's uh, time for discussion, and uh, Ilya, you can call this well. And, uh, and I guess we can do it uh, in the following way. So I start to ask questions and make discussions, and if you have any questions or you want to add something, just uh, raise your hand and I will ask you in between the questions. If you're interested in a semester and master project in superconducting theories, you can also do it. <laughs> Usually, the masters and the projects are better than the PhD projects. <laughs> Okay, I guess so we can start and uh, thank you again for the very nice explanation and I guess in most of the cases it's very new in this area and uh, I worked a bit in world groups and they're all very good and if you're interested about these topics I really recommend you to join these guys and uh, I would start with the topic uh, you mentioned especially Lia in the beginning of his talk is uh, hype 
uh, about this topic. So what do you say about it? And you just invited these people to your groups. Uh, but actually, it doesn't make any sense to join it now and uh, believe that uh, during your PhD, you can build a real quantum computer. Or just to, what should these people expect? OK, um, that's a very good question. So there was a, you know that there's Google and IBM. They are saying that they have built a quantum computer. And, uh, and uh, like IBM always says that, it, like everyone says, oh, we've, uh, that's useless. And useless in the sense that it can't solve any real physical application, real world application problem. And then uh, we're actually at a state where the question is, can it solve any problem like artificial problem better than a classical computer? And apparently the answer is probably no, we don't know of it. So there's like a kind of a race between being able to solve a real world problem uh, on a quantum computer, or not a real world problem, an artificial problem on a quantum computer. And then some, someone, uh, some math person comes in and says, okay, I've got a classical algorithm that can do the same, but on a laptop. And yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. What constitutes an artificial problem? Um, so uh, the Google uh, quantum supremacy experiment is you just do a bunch of gates, the easiest ones. You make, do a lot of them on a big amount of qubits. And then you sample from the probability distribution that you get. So the artificial problem is just doing the most easy thing to do on this specific quantum computer that is supposed to be difficult on a classical computer. Yeah, and uh, well, we haven't seen that so far. And then uh, there's a recent paper, like IBM always says that, okay, we're not doing this artificial stuff. Like, this is their PR is always like, we are, we are delivering product for our customers, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, there was a recent paper on Archive where a group has shown that they have an algorithm with a tensor like uh, project PEPS. I don't remember how it's uh, what it stands for, but it's like matrix product space, but like a higher dimensional tensors. And they say high rank tensors, and then they say, okay, we can simulate all the IBM quantum computers, and they're not happy about that at all because uh, it's contradicting the idea that they can deliver products. Like with 1,000 qubits, they say, you won't be able to deliver to your customers anything. So, and they're a bit behind schedule as well. Like probably four years ago, Google said, by 2030, we'll have a million qubits. And by 2024, I think we'll have 1,000 qubits. And they don't. <laughs> uh, you can already see that it's a bit more complicated than that. So there's problems. I've shown you this deep, I've shown you like uh, dielectric loss, but the problem is that some of the, the interfaces, they're annoying and they have these defects which are like mesoscopic dielectric loss. And it's all, when you get one step forward, you uh, arrive at a bunch of new problems that you haven't thought about before. Yeah, I, I will add like, I think, so I agree with most of what you say, uh, but there's, also, like some interesting things, and that is, I think we can. You have to be a bit smarter if you look at those companies. They have taken something that works, the transmog, and they grind it. And then there's maybe smarter ways of building quantum computers. And so that you get a bit of like back of the end. Like there's there's many different types of quantum computers that you could build, and they took the most popular one and really optimize the hell out of it. And maybe maybe it was a bit too early to start doing this. I don't know. Or maybe it will still work. But there's other ways um, of, of encoding information, which I've shown you as well, that possibly are more efficient and already have shown very promising quantum error correction capabilities, for example. So I think change comes very slowly and then very quickly. <laughs> so we'll see, uh, we'll see how progress comes. Yeah. And another thing that I will add is that, indeed, you're right about the tensor product, but the way they validated the algorithm is by <coughs> showing it does the same that data as the quantum computer. So you can also argue, OK, like you use a quantum computer to validate this classical algorithm. So it's a bit, 
Which, but I agree with what you say. Yes, you can still do it. On, still makes the algorithm valid, and it's. Yeah. Other question. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Not me. Yeah. One of you, but. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Have, I, have any orders been made yet? Orders. Yeah. I mean, to IBM or Google. Oh, okay, okay. That's that's very that's very a good very good question. So I'm giving you business advice. Okay. <laughs> so you take money from an investor, like four hundred million, right? Okay. Then you found a company. You're a very important person now. Now and you sell a product for ten million dollars to someone, and I mean the investment is returning. In, in principle, someone is paying you. Uh, the problem with that, I mean, uh, several, that doesn't look really viable. So uh, can you sell it? Yes, but it's eating more money than it's uh, generating. If you're looking from a business perspective, is it possible to sell something? Yes, but you're paying more money for being able to sell anything. And uh, I mean, it's like uh, that kind of product you can sell anywhere. Like you don't need a quantum computer for that. It's uh, kind of more like fraud, I'd say. Yeah, it's a policy scheme type thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, like a, it's a very good scheme how to uh, demonstrate that you're viable, but economically, I would say no, nah, not really, because it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think what people have been selling to is governments, and in a sense, a government has an incentive to uh, have technology developed. Like even if this quantum computing endeavor fails, you have. A lot of very smart people who worked on a project together, they know each other and they know how to solve problems. It's easy, like you can transfer those people to put on other projects. Um, so I don't think it's comp like these companies do have a purpose and that they can foster a lot of people together. So, yeah. But I agree that there's too much hype. Yes. And but it's the only way maybe of getting this to work. So. Another question? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for your talks. So, and um, my question is, uh, what's the main character of uh, problems, uh, of obstacles to build a quantum computer? I mean, uh, is it technical development, hardware stuff, or it's theoretical, mathematical, or uh, algorithmical stuff? So, what's the main? I would say it's more technical. But it's kind of the technical stuff that, uh, like, y you need to be a physicist. It, it's not like uh, we need more steel or something like that. There's not <laughs> enough. There's not enough uh, uh, the, trap, the trap is not long enough. We need a longer trap, and then you just do it. I mean, that's exactly what Google and IBM are doing. They're like, they have this huge fridge. Like IBM has, uh, in collaboration with Blue Force, uh, which is a company that produces these dill fridges that go to these. I didn't say anything about the temperature, like the temperature for superconducting qubits is 10 millikelvin, and that's a technical thing. So they've built a huge fridge which looks like a room already, like a small room, but a room. And they say, okay, we well, have a lot of qubits, so big chips, a lot of cables. Like, <laughs> it starts to look like a computer from the 60s. Yeah, like mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that with the hope that one of the qubits somewhere will actually do something? Sorry? Is that with the hope that something there in the massive uh, computer will do something? I don't quite. I mean, uh, if you look at the communication of IBM, I'm really not totally happy with that. I like it. So, Good question. Like, do I want to go to work for IBM? Am I happy what they're saying? I don't know what the hope is actually. Like, they're doing really good things, but I don't know what the hope is. No, no, I guess, <laughs> no. I, I think it was more specific actually. Um, it's to do with, so if you have a massive uh, fridge and you have an uh, enormous system there, it's the hope that uh, one of the. I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but qubits will actually. Okay, yeah. so the quantum error correction thing is that the more qubits you throw in, mm -hmm. the more errors it can handle. So essentially, yes, you need more to be able to kind of uh, accommodate for the errors. Then you need to both be above the threshold, and uh, we are at the moment somewhere close to the threshold. We need to be like uh, st stably beyond the threshold for error correction. So when you scale up, you need to actually, the error rate, so it's kind of exponential, right? 
uh, the amount of uh, the error rate that you get exponentially decays with the amount of qubits you throw in linear case. 17 qubits next up is like 49, 97, and so on. But like the recent work from Google was 17 and 49, and they show that they're equally bad. So they have the threshold. <laughs> so it means that if they make a little bit of gain, they're going to make a lot of gains if they scale. But they need to scale, and that's really hard. Yeah, but like at the moment, if they're scaling, they're not going yeah. to get any gain. So but if they make a bit of gain, they're going to stop making gains. Yeah. I mean, are they, you, you, I mean, you need to scale up, yes, but then the qubits need to be better, and probably not just some better, but like trapped iron level better. At the, least. the problem with them is that they, it's harder to make more qubits, right? bigger things. I think for trapped ions, it's, it's a very steady process that's like, so traditionally, maybe a bit of historic things, trapped iron community comes from atomic clocks, so they were rather calm people. And you can somehow still feel it in the community. The announcements in the trapped iron community are way more calm. IBM goes like, oh, we're going to deliver a fault tolerant quantum computer in 10 years. And the uh, trapped iron people are a bit more, yeah. Um, well, here's what we did, yeah. And a bit more rational, I find, having worked in both communities. And um, the, 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 the process, the progress that has been done is, is like really remarkable. And I think, I'm not saying we're going to have something useful, but the machines, I think, we're reaching into regimes where they're really hard to simulate. And at least for physics, it's going to be interesting to have those. Uh, maybe we can solve uh, physics problems with them before we're able to make a product out of it. But just having 100 ions in a string and being able to ground state cool them and manipulate them, we're not at the stage where we can do this, but we're getting there. And it's, it's interesting. Yeah? You can do a lot of like, quantum simulation with this, where you simulate, so you, you make your ions behave as if they were some electrons in a gas, or some spins in a magnetic field or whatever, and then you, these problems are very hard to calculate classically, and maybe we can simulate them and, and see some things. It's, I think it's my thing, you can disconnect the HTML. So, yeah, I, but yeah, there's too much hype. Okay, so maybe then uh, we can move through the next question. And and this was uh, another yeah. question. <laughs> Uh, did I understand your gate uh, x2 qubit gate explained correctly that uh, if you have uh, like an amount of trapped ions, you can only ever apply one two qubit gate in parallel? Um, it's more complicated than this because every ion adds modes. Mm -hmm. So if you want one body has three modes, it can oscillate this way, this way, this way. Mm -hmm. Then if you have two ions, they can oscillate like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. So there's six of them. And so the short, like the, the theoretical answer, no, it's fine. In practice, those modes become very close in frequency. Then it becomes very hard to play the game I told you about this tirak Um But the thing is, we can just split up our strings. So I can really, and I do this also in my lab, I have my, let's say I have six ions, and I can just go like, chic. And then I do two, cub two, two qubit gates here, and then I bring them back. And this is what, so the ion strings, they are like, you can just, so this racetrack I've shown you, they just move around the ions like this. And they're going to add a junction, and then they can sort them and move them around. <laughs> OK, so you can actually, like, because I think, I mean, what you really want to do is uh, have, like, sort of 2D or 3D uh, things that you can connect, like, have yeah. more connectivity, because 1D is a bit, uh, I mean, MPS is. <laughs> Yeah, it's, <laughs> what you really need is actually more important than dimensions is that you have all-to-all uh, -all connectivity. And the nice thing about the strings is that any ion can theoretically talk to any ion. And then this is better than having maybe two connections but to auto your neighbors. So it's, it's somehow like this, depends on what you want. Right? <coughs> to me, there's no clear winner, but yeah. And maybe we should mention here neutral atoms. Uh, who's like another platform for this, which is very similar to ions, but instead of trapping with electric fields, they trap with lasers. You can also like trap things with lasers, so they do everything with lasers, not only, like we do nearly everything with lasers, they do everything with lasers. And, and then you can do also, like you can, you can make a grid of atoms and you can really move them around in space and 
and like have them interact. And, yeah. So elegant platforms. Good question. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, what uh, impact do you envisage from this field on um, encryption? Uh -huh. <laughs> I think we're very far from breaking any encryption. Very, very far. So this is nice, right? Because in a sense, there's a lot of government who goes like bananas on this and says, oh, we need to invest in quantum computing. And then the, it's somehow always ethically questionable to work for military purposes. Like, is this really a good thing? But then in a sense, it's a good thing, for me at least, that it's so hard to break encryption that before we break encryption, we're going to have solved a bunch of problems like chemistry. So I don't know what you think about this. I think uh, encryption is actually a very good thing that we have it, because like, if you look at the first uh, classical computers, uh, like breaking encryption was one of the features. And like, we didn't have a lot of algorithms back then. Uh, for a few bits and uh, so this seems like one application where you can actually formulate what the application is like with quantum chemistry like you say okay I'm going to solve quantum chemistry someone can say I'm going to solve like cancer climate change no, no, like, what does that there's mean? algorithms right yeah there, there are algorithms but and, uh, it's, I think it's sound no it's it's sound I'm not saying it's not sound it's like uh, the vagueness is just growing and the, the, it's nice that you have an application okay it's completely stupid like breaking encryption, you know, but uh, it's at least a problem which is formulated in a way that you can build that algorithm right now. You know what you're doing, and that's actually good. Now, uh, is it bad that we break encryption? I think we have other encryption algorithms. Then probably not great. Okay, that's true. So, not post quantum cryptography is not a solved field. You can still get a PhD thesis in that, but. Uh, I have another question, actually, on a similar topic. Um, did this apply to the P versus NP problem as well? There's an equivalence between quantum algorithms, like in, in terms of like algorithmic like classes. Mm -hmm. if, okay. uh, but it's not exactly clear, but right. I mean, it's not clear, but that you can run any classical algorithm on a quantum computer and vice versa. Okay. I think, I think uh, the thing is uh, you've got a complexity class BQP. Like uh, for all quantum computers, that's why you have a universal quantum computer, which is kind of capable to simulate another universal quantum computer. Uh, but uh, okay, so this BQP and NP are different classes. Okay, okay we don't know. Maybe P is equal and to NP. That's, a, that's a, you don't need to ask an experimental physicist about that. Probably so we have we have no idea. Yeah, and if we do, that's probably a bad thing. <laughs> Okay, then I can continue with my questions. And I would like to emphasize that uh, when we're talking about trapped ions, uh, we are talking about uh, seconds and it's, uh, coherence time. And uh, in case of superconducting qubits, it's uh, microseconds. But also we should think about uh, the gate time. And the gate time in superconducting qubits, it's nanoseconds. And in uh, trapped ions, I guess it's microseconds. So Depends what gates okay. are. So the ratio, I guess, it's comparable. and. Uh, if we assume that we managed to build a workable quantum computer and now we want to imply a lot of operations, that uh, how would uh, these times uh, influence uh, these operations? So I guess the faster we can do, the better. But maybe there are also some technical questions. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, we can agree that ions are better. I think but ions have a bit of a better ratio, but they are terribly slow. This yeah, so that's yeah. the question. Yeah, the, the nice thing I love I love about ions is that uh, if you look at the setup for ions, you have the string, you have a AOM, and then you have a laser, and the AOM is fed with how many channels? So, like for superconducting qubits, you saw all the wires, right? Like the, the whole chip is just wire here, wire there, and every qubit has going to it a line. And those huge fridges, like the the, the 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 room, the computing room, it's just a room for cables, like to cool down cables going from room temperature to low temperature. So that huge thing is huge because it has wires because it's huge, and. Uh, 
with uh, trap dyes, I think you kind of you can have a frequency multiplexing. You have your acoustic optical modulator. You shine a laser. You have some frequencies, some carrier frequencies, and your modulator has a bandwidth of one gigahertz or something. Depends. I don't know. There are some, yes. Yeah, but it, it doesn't look like you have a lot of electronics. And the reason why you can do that is because the gates are not fast. So it's actually uh, the trade-off of having these fast gates is incredibly high. You don't really want them so badly, I guess. But I guess if you need to perform like 1,000 operations or more, then it's quite important. I think if you run numbers, like very pessimistic numbers on quantum error correction and very naive, so it takes like years to solve anything very complex, like what people promise you on a like Shor's algorithm to factorize large numbers takes forever on an ion trap quantum computer, and like we're talking years. Mm -hmm. And then, but I mean, there's ways of doing it faster. So people have, yeah, I agree. So I agree. But I think uh, one thing is with ions is that the, it's also a different type of problem. Like it's really like his architecture is really wires that need to go to the chip. We can have lasers, so they have downsides. But once you Make, but but it's somehow less mature, and so there's still work that can be done towards process. Like for example, waveguides for lasers is just like wires for cables. Wires for cables have existed for ages. Imagine they were building qubits and putting an antenna next to a superconducting piece in a vacuum chamber. Like this is basically what ions were like ten years ago. Yeah, it's very primitive technology compared to what you guys were able to use because of the military technology. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think the, the coax cables, like military technology. But radars have driven this a lot, right? Yeah, but like, I mean, just come on, those military guys are not so smart. I mean, it's, it's coax. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, just a piece the, of wire. Okay, yeah, sure, but like, the radar, like, there's a huge radio frequency industry. And which, yeah, which <laughs> is less mature in, in lasers. Nobody uses blue lasers or red lasers. In industry, everybody uses like fiber optics for telecommunication lasers, yeah, which are at completely wrong frequencies for. for yeah, that, that, that's a different thing. I mean, I think the, the thing here is that uh, you, uh, like in ions, you also have uh, microwave transitions. Yeah, that's but important. you don't like them. You use the optical transitions because uh, you can focus a laser onto them. So yeah, routing is easier for for microwave frequencies because the frequency is lower. I mean. Uh, like uh, one of the recent developments with superconducting qubits is actually lowering the frequency, probably slowing everything down, but then the coherence also kind of recovers a bit. So getting slower is actually probably something good. So for now. Yeah. And then uh, we'll see what, how the time moves and maybe we'll have to get it faster again. And if we're talking about different lasers, so in uh, trapped ions uh, we use optical lasers, and uh, in uh, superconducting circuits you use microwaves, and in just uh, room temperature electronics, uh, again, came from new parts, I guess. And uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, stability, or maybe how good precision you can uh, get from these lasers and, and uh, room temperature electronics, and how good you can manipulate them, so how can you compare these two systems? I think you can do very unfair comparisons, and that's saying that I get like my laser to 10 hertz accurate, and it's 400 terahertz, so it's like very accurate in frequency. But I, no idea. I think, uh, so I think the, the it's unfair because um, the reason why it's unfair is because you have a carrier frequency of the laser, right? And then you modulate it. Yeah. And are you face sensitive to your modulation? Probably you're yes, face yes, sensitive to your sensitive. modulation. So essentially you have the laser and you have the microwaves, yeah. and we just don't have the laser, it's which the is, same. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's why I like electric qubits. I mean, electric computers, who want, the, you can build a, a uh, classical computer from ions, I guess, but no one wants to do that because it's uh, just it does, it's not worth it. And for quantum computers, it's worth it because I mean, uh, it's uh, it doesn't exist just electric. <laughs> yeah. So, like, who's winning? Like, no one at the moment is winning. When someone is winning, then we can c congratulate the winner. But at the moment, we just need to work more.
<laughs> I'd be very happy to see the other win. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, everyone will be happy. I mean, uh, it's like, a, is this a race? Is this a competition? No. Who's better? Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a race, but we're not com the competition is not between the different platforms. That probably, you know, or each of the, everyone is uh, fighting, not the other group for money, but rather uh, with a setup that it works and it's better. So that's how we do it. Or I guess you've got IBM and Google fighting for the money. I don't know. I mean, I don't Google. know what the, the 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 idea behind it is. I, I think Google has more than enough. Yeah, Google just, has also quite a lot of money. Just uh, use clickbait to get money, basically, right? No, I think it's it's actually a smart strategy from Google. If you think about it, on the terms of the, so they want smart people to work for them, and then they just go, okay, what's interesting right now to people? How do I check just hardworking smart people? And they say, oh, let's build a quantum computer, and then they have this talent. And maybe in two years they can use it for doing something else. To be fair, it's the same in astronomy. I mean, um, people put up articles saying that they've discovered aliens, when yeah. in reality it's just a journalist that's twisted the words a little bit. But it makes money, so. Yeah. <laughs> and we need money. I'm not it's, it's so, such a strong believer in capitalism, so I don't know why they're doing it. And it's just like, okay, they're doing it. I'm fine. Do you, what, what do you think? Will you get uh, proper error corrected qubits before the venture capitalists find out that this is not going to solve finance <laughs> optimization? Uh, that's exactly the reason why I don't believe in uh, capitalism. I mean, uh, I don't know if the venture capitalists are actually as dumb as we think they are. I don't really think they are. I expect them to understand that it's not so easy. Uh, but why don't they, why do they put all the money in there? Because you don't need to have a working quantum computer. You just need to sell it to somebody else, right? Like, for example... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's the point. <laughs> no, but uh, to give a, an example of this, the, the, there was two companies, Rigetti and INQ, both did something called a SPAC, a Special Purpose Acquisition Company. And that is basically something where you create a stock, but it's not really a stock. Anyways, um, and the way they did this is, so they, these were companies which started in 2014, 15, and the investors were like, okay, we want our money back now. The comp, like they invested back then, and they said, now we want to cash out. It's a good moment of the hype. So what they do is they create this type of thing that goes on the stock market, and then it's not really an IPO, but it's kind of like an IPO. And then they get the money back, and people can buy shares. The company is doing its own thing. And, and they got the money people, and that's how it worked for this case. So, and to give another example, like, you, you never know what comes out of these things, but for example, the company I was working at in Finland, they also do electronics, and maybe they can sell those electronics. And, and so, those people, they just see an opportunity to make smart people work on something, and something comes out. And then, it's basically like a surfer taking credit for the wave. Yeah, yeah. You need to jump off before it breaks down. Yeah. Sorry. I guess IQM sold Yes, this is another thing. So this company in question called IQM in Finland, they have a very active lobby where they go to the government. In Finland, there used to be Nokia. We don't hear that much about it anymore. So there's a bit of a trauma there. Imagine like Apple came from Finland. It's a bit like how it was in the 2000s. I mean, we we grew up with this, right? And then, <laughs> And so they were a bit adamant. They're very happy to have a good quantum computing company, and they fund this with government money. And the investors are happy because this company sells things. The government is happy because the country innovates, and the people are happy because they are employed, and kind of a circle. Um, and actually, they're delivering results, which is surprising because they started from very little. But they have, I think you were saying, it's probably one of the best European-built quantum computers. So, and they're playing the European card, like technological sovereignty. We need to be independent of the US, which I think is also maybe stupid, but also reasonable in these days, I don't know. So it's, it's interesting to see how it's not all black and white, like these venture capitalists are not stupid, maybe a bit naive sometimes, but that's fine. Like, yeah. Okay, so it's already seven, and uh, I still have quite a lot of questions. But uh, and I guess you also have quite, question, quite some questions, and uh, we can continue during the apparel. Yeah. So let's thank again our speakers. Yeah.